uh, we look at this text um, that is going to focus on patience as a fruit of the Spirit, uh, loving patience. And so uh, let's read this text, follow in your Bible or on the screen here, uh, James 5, 7 through 12. We remember and we are glad the Holy Spirit inspired these very words. Um, and so this is God speaking to us if we have ears to hear. Let's listen for the Spirit. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Let's take a moment to pray. So this is a good pause for us, Father, um, remembering that you're present here by your Holy Spirit and remembering that we need you um, Speak through me, I pray. Teach us all. Um, our, our primary goal, God, is not, again, just amassing information, um, but to become like you, to know you, um, to be known fully. And so, God, uh, do this transforming work, which is only by the power of your Holy Spirit. So we confess and acknowledge our dependence on you. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Um, but as we call out to you, we have confidence that you are a good father. And as your children, as we ask you for good things, that you won't turn away from us. And so thank you for hearing our prayer and for being at work right now. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so I know you couldn't wait for a sermon on patience, so here it is. So we're there. Um, I need to point out to you, uh, as I kind of said this over the course of these last several weeks, as we've talked about these different, um, really, expressions of love. Remember we said there's one fruit of the Spirit, which is love. And then the rest of that list, because that, that word is in the singular, so there's one fruit of the Spirit, um, which is love, but then love gets expressed in all of these different ways. And so today we want to link that with patience, um, but I also mentioned that when you start on this journey where you say yes to Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you. In that very moment that you surrender your life, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you. So now you have Christ living in you, um, that you would see this process, though, as a battle. It's a struggle. And the reason is, I've mentioned really three different reasons why. One reason is your old sinful nature is still there. And so when the Holy Spirit is saying, I want to make you into a patient person, your old nature and my old nature is going to fight that. So you're going to have within you desires that go against the very flow of the Holy Spirit saying, I'm going to make you into a patient person who looks like Jesus in that respect. So our inner nature, our old nature, which is dying and passing away, and by the way, it will not win. In the end, the new nature in Christ is going to win out. But for now, it's a battle. It's a struggle. Um, the other reason that it's going to be a battle is because you have an enemy. So we've talked about the fact that you enter into a spiritual war, and so this transformation, becoming like Jesus, you have someone who is constantly looking to pull you away from Jesus, and that is the devil, who is the enemy of all the children of God. So you've got this internal battle, but you also have this external spiritual war, and there's another reason why this will be a battle, and that is because the world, the Bible often calls it the world, meaning the culture, the society that we live in, um, which in many, many ways is, again, trying to pull you away from the very thing that the Holy Spirit's trying to do within us. 
And in this respect especially, I, I think you need to just be aware that the culture that we live in is really going to fight us on patience. I was just reading this week, some sociologists have noted how um, over the centuries, throughout humankind, you can kind of trace this, it's not just um, that we're busy, and maybe busier than other generations. Um, the fact is that there is this speed, of, things have speeded up so much that it's the things that we do, but the, the speed at which we do them has actually become a big factor. In fact, it, it affects you and me more than we think. It's sort of like a fish does not know how wet it is because it's surrounded by water. That's what it lives in. You and I are so surrounded by the speed at which our culture has, has kind of ramped things up. We're not even really aware of how it's changing the way that we relate to God and we relate to one another. And so let me just highlight a few things that um, I was reading about. They said this is across the board, really, that our culture has, has sped up, um, like in transportation. So before you get mechanical transportation in human history, you have people who are basically getting from point A to point B by walking. And if not, maybe riding a, a horse or an animal of some kind. But gen generally speaking, they could get about 15 to 20 miles in a day maximum in trying to travel transportation. Maybe if you had a ship or a boat, you know, Noah, we don't know how fast the ark went. We do know that it took him six months to find a parking spot. So it would take a long time, even if you're doing that. So until then, you're, you're kind of limited. But then things started to speed up when you get mechanical transportation, cars and trucks. Now it's not just 20 miles in a day. You can go 800 miles in a day. And I know some of you will come after the service and tell me, I did 1,000 miles on one of my trips, or 1,200, whatever. You can go a lot farther. The speed at which we travel, of course, has picked up tremendously. Ferdinand Magellan's crew was the first humans to circle the globe. It took them three years to do it, over three years to circle the globe. In 1992, an Air France flight circled the globe in 33 hours. And right now, the International Space Station is circling the globe every 92 minutes. So in the course of one of Pastor Cliff's sermons, they will circle it four or five times all the way around. That's pretty fast. They're saying, but as you go through these transformations in, in transportation, you say, well, I'm just getting from here to there faster. But it actually changes the way that you think, the way that you respond to the world around you. Communication has increased in its speed. So in 1776, when we declared our independence from England... I didn't know this. They signed the Declaration of Independence. It actually was one month later before England knew about it because we wrote them a letter, which was nice of us, to let them know that we were declaring our independence. It took them a whole month for that letter to reach London. That was normal. That was actually a pretty good time, generally. The first transatlantic telegram, which you would think would be a little bit more instantaneous, took 10 um, hours to get from the United States over to England. It sped up a little bit more, though, course, when you get phones. Phones are instantaneous kind of communication. But even when phones first came out, I asked this at the first service, so I'll ask it here. Anybody, did you grow up with a rotary phone? Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. A rotary phone was this really cool phone. It's, it's the only phone you had. You didn't just press a button to dial a number. You actually had this little dial, and you would have to take your finger and take a number and go all the way around to an ending point, let it go, and then it would go all the way back. That was one number. And then you go to the next one, next one, next one. And if you screwed it up halfway through, you had to start all over again, hang it up. Oh, it took forever to dial up. And now your phones are so smart you don't even need to know the number of other people that you're calling. In fact, 40% of you do not know your own phone number because your phone is so smart you don't have to, and it's instantaneous. Hey, call so-and-so, bam. The, the point is the speed up of everything, every aspect of our life begins to change the way that we relate to God and to one another, which is crucial for disciples because our whole point is what? God is fashioning and shaping us into a people who love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. And this is playing a factor. Patience, in fact, um, begins to make things feel 
very difficult when they're actually not. It's sort of like if you've been driving on Interstate 80, I-80, all day long, because what's the speed limit on I-80 now, 115 miles per hour or something like that, and you're driving on that all day long, and you get off, and now you're on a road that the speed limit is 40 miles per hour, you, don't you actually feel it in your body? You're just like, oh, I mean, are we even moving? Take your head out the window. Are we moving? Or it, it feels so slow, and what, what their sociologists are saying is, what this does is it transfers the way that you think about and relate God, to God. Like, is God even doing anything? Because I'm used to, we do something that's bam, bam. And God seems to have this pattern where it's not bam, bam. It's, I'm going to give you this promise. And now, when is it going to happen, Lord? Well, in my time. And this becomes really difficult for us then. How can I continue in a relationship that is constantly frustrating? The, the really hard part is that patience has become, in one sense, we, we, and I'm not judging you because I do this. You ever joke about patience? Hey, it's a sermon on patience. Don't pray for patience. Whatever you do, don't pray for patience. I prayed for patience once, and immediately my hot water heater broke down, and I got stuck on customer service for six hours, and my in-laws invited themselves to stay for 30 days at my home. And that all happened because I prayed for patience. So we joke about it, Lord. If you pray for patience, life is going to get harder, more difficult. So don't pray for patience. But here's the thing. You have to pray for it because to be impatient is to be unloving. You can't love unless you're going to be patient with people and with God. The, the love chapter in the Bible 1 Corinthians 13, it's a chapter that focuses on love, and the most interesting thing to me is that if you're going to describe love to me, what words will you use? And I would think, if you're going to say, hey, love is, it's, it's powerful, it's, it's passionate, it's strong, it's beautiful, and the very first word used to describe love in the love chapter of the Bible is what? Love is patient. I would have never, I would have never picked that. Love is patient? It's so crucially important that we don't see patience as a side thing that's maybe I might have it, maybe I don't. It's not that big a deal. If I don't have patience, I can't love. It's that critical. It's that important. And James helps us because he says, I want to give you a, a full picture of what patience really means. So kind of our definition drawn from this, these verses that we read, James actually gives us two words for patience. And they kind of give a, they kind of flesh this out a little bit here for us. So one means long suffering. You listen to Pastor Cliff's sermons long enough. That's long suffering. All right, you're going to suffer for a long time, but you don't, you don't act out or you don't give in. You know, you don't give up and you don't act out. So what I mean by that is this: acting out is I'm going to respond in frustration, anger. Because I want this to be over, I need this to be done, this person's not cooperating, and suddenly you find yourself, and then James gives us a couple examples here, grumbling and cursing. And he's saying, don't do that to one another, because he's saying, when you get impatient, one of the things that kicks in is, I'm going to act out. In other words, I'm going to lash out in such a way that I will force it to happen. I'm going to make it happen. It's not happening. It's certainly not happening when it should have happened, but I'm going to make it happen now. And the other one is this sense of enduring, kind of persevering under pressure. Because in that sense, you reach a point where you can just say, I'm not going to lash out. I'm not going to act out. I'm just going to give up. I quit. I'm done waiting. I've waited long enough, and I'm done with this. James says both of these are examples, and the examples he gives for the, those who didn't give up, who persevered, who had patience, he says, oh, think of the, the prophets and think of Job. And so he's giving these examples to say, if you get this big picture of patience, that's exactly what God wants to work within our lives. And the way this happens, again, we said is that the Holy Spirit is going to do this, but we want to think about relationship with God. How do we have patience with God and how do we have patience with one another? Patience with God would kind of go along these lines. You look at what God's plan, purpose, what he calls you to do, 
commandments, obedience, do this, don't do that, wait here, wait for me to do something. All of these commands and these walking with God. And at some point, if you are not patient, you will either act out towards God, which is, if God's not going to do it, then I'm going to. And you force the issue, or you give up. And there are positive examples in the Scriptures. This is what James wants you to think about. He says, this is going to be really helpful if you have examples of people who were patient. Why is that helpful for us? Because you see yourself in them. Because you see yourself in the bigger story of what God's doing. Now, there are negative examples in the Bible. So, for instance, a kind of a classic one was King Saul, the first king of Israel, He was um, massing his troops together for a battle against the Philistines, but the Philistines far outnumbered them. They're really kind of scared in this moment, but God has made it clear, look, I'm going to lead you into battle, but here's the thing. Never, never go into battle unless first you've sought my favor, you've sought my direction, you've sought my, my kind of what does God want us to do. And to do that, I want you to offer sacrifices before you go into this battle, and only Samuel, my prophet, is to offer those sacrifices. Samuel says to King Saul, I know you're getting ready for this battle. I'll meet you at such and such a place in such and such a time. Saul says, great, except that Samuel's running late. He's not there when he's supposed to be. And at the very same time, Saul's getting nervous because he knows the Philistines, they're not going to wait to fight. They're amassing, they're getting ready. And to top it off, some of my own troops, Saul says, are starting to see that they're far overwhelmed in numbers and they're beginning to desert. They're leaving. And we're waiting and waiting and waiting. God, you said we're supposed to do this. I'm waiting on Samuel. He's not here. And Saul, instead of patience, instead of trusting that God actually is still with them and is going to do something, says, I got to make it happen. And so he begins to offer these sacrifices when he's not supposed to. He thinks he's doing God a favor. God, I know, can't go into battle without this. But God says, no, I'm not, I'm not interested in that so much as your trust in me. And so even when Samuel's late, trust me. And so we see this example of impatience where God says, that's all I needed you to do. But you acted out and you said, if God's not going to do it, then I'm the only one that's going to make it happen. The positive examples, of course, he says, are the prophets and Job. And when you think about their lives, which is what James wants us to do, okay? You want patience? Think about these guys' lives because here's the deal. When you think about the prophets like Isaiah, God says to Isaiah, you're going to be my prophet. You're going to go and speak and preach and teach in my name. And you're going to say the words that I give you. And here's the deal, Isaiah. You're going to preach and teach for about 20, 30 years. And I'm just telling you in advance, because this is early in the book of Isaiah, they're not going to listen to you. They're, not going to, they're going to see, but not really see. They're going to hear, but not really hear. They're, going to, they're not going to understand. There's not going to be a revival. They're not going to turn and respond to all of your preaching. And, you, and at some point, if I'm Isaiah, I'm thinking, well, then what's the point? Like, what's the point of me being sent on this mission when, God, you're already telling me they're going to reject the message? And it begins to test immediately patience. But Isaiah is patient. And he preaches to a people who never turn, who don't respond to his message. But he is faithful in persevering, and he receives a lot of blowback from people. Furthermore, Jeremiah, he's really a great example of a prophet. God tells him to say, I'm going to send you to a people, and by the way, they're going to reject you. And they really reject him. People in his hometown want to kill Jeremiah. They throw him in a muddy cistern at one point. At one point, God tells Jeremiah, I want you to tell the nation of Israel that I've already determined that I'm bringing this foreign power Babylon to destroy them. I want you to tell King Zedekiah to surrender to this pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. I want you to go ahead and just tell him to surrender. And that way the city won't be burned to the ground if he's willing to surrender. And Jeremiah goes, this is the worst sermon ever because I'm going to be a traitor they're going to see this as absolute treason. I'm unpatriotic because I'm not you know, saying, no, we're going to stand against them. I'm saying, God has said we're supposed to surrender to this pagan nation. Well, more than that, Jeremiah, when they're taken in exile, I want you to tell them not to curse these pagan people. I want you to tell them to pray for the city, pray for the prosperity and peace of this pagan city. 
And I want you to tell them all of that. And by the way, they're going to hate it. Now go get them. And he does. And he doesn't quit. And he doesn't say, there's no point. And I don't think either Isaiah or Jeremiah or most of the prophets ever saw the point. I think they got the word and they faithfully persevered. They said, I don't understand it. I don't get it. But God is good. I know he's true. I know he's right. I'm going to hang on and I'm going to fulfill this mission patiently and not give up. This is the idea of patience. And James says, it's going to help you in your patience. Think on these people because they're ordinary, flawed sinners like you and me, redeemed by the grace of God, and now God can do this work in you and me as well. And here's the thing. I think most of our struggles with patience is we think it's a waste of time. For me to just wait doesn't accomplish anything. And part of this, again, is because of the culture that we're in. Time is money. Time is everything. How fast does it take to happen? you got to make it happen. And here God is saying, just wait. But God, nothing happens. Something's happening in the waiting. Something is happening in the waiting. When God tells his people to wait, it's not just so that there's this pause, but he's saying, I want to do something in you so that when I bring to fulfillment what I've told you, you're ready for it. You can bear it. And so you see this over and over. Abraham and Sarah, I'm going to give you a child. You've been childless your whole life. I know that you're old. You're just old prunes at this point. You think there's no point. There's no way. I'm going to bring you this son. I give you the promise 25 years. Why 25 years? And he doesn't tell them ahead of time it's 25 years. They have to patiently live it. Why 25 years? Because you're not ready to be the father and mother of a great nation yet. But I'm going to change you. The waiting is not wasted time. It's time where I'm transforming you. Mary and Martha had to wait days when they had sent word to Jesus, Lazarus, our brother, is sick, and we know that you're one of our closest friends, and we have this tight bond. We know that if word gets to Jesus, he's going to come. He's going to drop what he's doing, and he is going to haul it over to where we are because he loves us. We know he loves us. And Jesus specifically It's so hard to read this stuff because then we start thinking of our lives. Jesus specifically waits until Lazarus dies. And the first thing that Mary and Martha, Martha says, you know, too bad that you weren't here. Mary is just unconsolable. It's too late now. What good does it do now for Jesus to show up? The waiting was wasted. Jesus is really revealing to them, no, it's not. Because see, what I want to do is I want to put in you this truth that I don't think you would have got otherwise. That there's not just a time that you look forward to heaven and the resurrection. Jesus says, I want you to learn, and you will never forget this, this time of waiting, you'll never forget this. I am the resurrection and the life. It's not just a resurrection. I am the resurrection. And with me, it's never too late. Why? Because I can raise the dead. It's never too late. But you can't learn that unless you go through the waiting. There's always something that God's doing in the waiting, and it's almost always about changing who I am so that when the waiting's over, I'm ready. Because I'm not ready usually. The disciples had to wait 10 days in Jerusalem after Jesus' ascension. Before the Holy Spirit has come, comes on the day of Pentecost, there's this kind of this 10-day gap where Jesus ascends, and it's like, why didn't he ascend on day 49 instead of day 40? Because, gosh, we've got 10 full days of just waiting. We're just wasting time. No, we're not. We're actually getting into the Scriptures in ways we hadn't before. We're actually praying and fellowshipping together. And it could it be that in that 10-day period, Jesus is actually training them to say, Guys, I've been walking with you for these past three and a half years. you got to start learning how to discern that I'm present when you can't see me. you got to start gaining confidence that the thought that I put into your mind is my thought and discern it from all the other thoughts that are going on in your mind. And the only way that you can learn this is in this waiting period right here. That God is never wasting. We always say God never wastes your pain. God also never wastes your waiting. Never. I was reading this really interesting journal. Maybe some of you read it. 
Those of you know, you know the Oregon Trail, and our teachers do a great job of just kind of highlighting, hey, the Oregon Trail is just by us over here. All those people who went, well, Phoebe Judson, I don't know if you've heard her, Phoebe Judson and her husband Holden Judson were on one of those wagon trains where they got a series of wagons that traveled together for protection and whatnot. She wrote a journal back in May of 1853. They left from Kansas City going on this 2,000-mile journey over to, to Oregon on the Oregon Trail. And she's writing in this journal, and it's just fascinating kind of stuff. She said, so our wagon train, which had a number of wagons together, different families that had come together, as every wagon train did, she said, they voted on a captain, someone who would be the person in charge, who would make the tough decisions, decide what we're doing when, and all of that. Every wagon train did this, she said, and so we decided, we chose on Reverend Gustavus Hines, to be our captain of our wagon train. Never put a pastor as the head of your wagon train, is my first thought. But this pastor decided this, okay, you've made me captain, here's the deal. This is the unbreakable rule that on every Sunday, we will not travel at all, but we will rest on the Sabbath. Now, bear in mind, they're moving at oxen rate here, which is at, at best 15 to 20 miles a day, and when you have somebody who tells you up front, every seventh day, we're not going to make any distance. We're not going to travel at all. We're going to stay where we are, and we're going to take that as a Sabbath day rest. And she, I love the way that she wrote some of She's very, very honest. She thought, this is ridiculous. This is crazy. Time is pressed to get from Kansas City to Oregon before winter hits. So we got to make as much time as we possibly can, and it will be wasted time to take every seventh day as a Sabbath and go nowhere. And she said it was so frustrating because they went a couple days, and then a Sunday comes, a Sabbath comes, and they take a Sabbath rest, and she says, and there are these wagon trains that are passing them as they are just sitting and waiting. You know how it's like when you're on a long journey, and your kids have to go to the bathroom, and you don't want to stop and then you take the stop, and it drives you crazy because you see all these cars you had already passed, and they're passing you on the interstate, and you're like, oh, we're wasting time, we're losing time. She's like, it was driving us crazy because everybody was making good time, and we were stopping. She said, a few days into our journey, we got to our first river crossing, and she said you had to cross on a ferry, and they had to take all, each wagon individually, and she said there was such a line and backup. It took us, we got there on a Tuesday, she said, but it took three days before they got to our wagon train to cross. So we're waiting and waiting and waiting. We finally cross. We got on the other side of the river on a Saturday. And the next day is a Sunday. And is he really going to take this? That We've been waiting three days to cross. Yeah, Sabbath, we're not going to go anywhere. And she said, this is so frustrating that one of the people, one of the wagons in their wagon train decided to go with one of the wagon trains that were passing them hey, we're done, we're out of here, we got to keep going. But then she said they continued this routine week after week, and she said the interesting thing was as we got further along on the trail, she began to notice dead oxen on the side of the trail, the dead animals that had been driven so hard that they couldn't make it, broken down wagon trains all over the place. She said, and, and here we were moving along, and she said, I also noticed something else that Compared to the other wagon trains, we had this remarkable kind of fellowship because on every Sabbath day, we not only rested, but we ate together and we played together. And she said there was a remarkable lack of grumbling that took place within our wagon train. And she said what really clinched it for me was as we made our way further and further on the trail, I had assumed that this one, she said, this one wagon that had left us and gone on what had been way, way ahead of us, they were actually behind us. They caught up to us as we were resting on a Sabbath day, and they asked, could we please rejoin your wagon train? And they began to see the wisdom of, of waiting. Something is happening in the waiting, and it feels like when God says, and I know it's hard. I mean, gosh, some of you are in a waiting season right now in your life. You're like, you're, you're praying that Old Testament prayer. How long, oh Lord? Like, how long? Because all of everything is passing me by. Life is passing me by. And what possible good could come from this time of waiting? And 
Do you see that what God is saying is, no, there's something that's going to give a strength for the journey to come. And if you try to bypass that, this journey will crush you. And I did not make you for that purpose. Patience trains us to live with this delayed gratification. Our sped up culture says, get it and get it now. If you want it, you can have it right now. And God's like, no, I want to train you and teach you that the goal, the satisfaction, that, that, that gratification is coming, but you have to hold off. You have to wait on it. Can you do that? Some of you, God is asking right now, can you wait delayed gratification with your sexual desires? Because you're like, no, I, why should I have to wait? Two consenting adults, it's no big deal. God, we, we don't have to wait at all. We can have it right now. And God's like, can you trust me that waiting, that there's something that happens in the waiting, it's not wasted, but you're changing and becoming the person who's going to be able to bear a greater blessing. Can you trust God in that? I mean, some of you are, have been praying about something for so long. And the question is, God's saying, can you, can you wait in the prayer? I've already been waiting. Some of you have been wronged. There's an injustice. And, and our hearts rightfully say, no, God, this is wrong. And when you say, God, what's going to become of this? Are you going to fix this? Are you going to deal with this? And God says, I will. Entrust that judgment, that justice to me. Don't take vengeance for yourself, but entrust it to me. And when God delays and it feels like he's waiting and waiting and waiting and it's not getting fixed, it's not getting rectified, I'm either going to give up I'm going to act out. Well, then I've got to take vengeance for my own. Can you delay gratification and satisfaction with the trust that God will do it, but in his time? Waiting for healing, waiting for some other breakthrough. What about people? Long-suffering with people, patient with people. Don't act out, don't give up with people. Don't grumble against one another, James says. Brothers and sisters, don't swear. What, why, what's with the grumbling and the cursing, the oath-taking? Literally, it's oath-taking, which is another way kind of to throw a curse at someone or something. Why, why, do we, why is he talking about that in terms of patience? He's like, well, because it's a way in which you act out. You, you act out by trying to control people, even with your words. I mean, like if, I, if you sold me a, a, lawn, a push lawnmower, you know, the kind that you got to start by pulling the cord and whatnot. You sell it to me, I take it home. I'm trying all day long. I can't get the thing started. I come back to you next Sunday. I'm like, hey, thanks for the lawnmower, but here's the deal. I can't get it started. And you say to me, I forgot to tell you one thing, Pastor Cliff. You have to keep pulling like that, but while you pull, you have to cuss at it. You have to go ahead and just cuss at the mower, and then it will start. And I say, you know, I'm a pastor, been a long time since I really let loose cussing, and so I don't even know if I'll remember that. And you say to me, just keep pulling. It'll come back to you, right? You know, you just, it'll come. What, why, do we, why do we cuss out things? Now, a lawnmower doesn't care. It doesn't. You can cuss at it all day. People care. You know it. If someone has cursed you out, you actually physically feel it. Because what you feel is that someone is saying, you are making me so impatient. You're not doing what I want you to do. You're not being the person I need you to be. And therefore, I'm going to act out. I'm going to control you. And people can be controlled by sheer intimidation and force of words. James says, don't, don't curse. Because what you're doing is you're showing impatience. You don't trust God in it. And now impatience toward people, you're trying to control them with your very words. Don't curse. And by the way, it's not just the cursing, but the grumbling. Cursing is a very kind of aggressive form of this, but grumbling is the more passive-aggressive sort of way. They did a study. They said, you know, if you go to a restaurant or someplace where you're served, where someone is actively serving you, um, and, and you don't like the service that they're giving you, 96% of people will not complain. They won't tell the manager. They won't tell the person directly. They will just say, look, I'm not going to complain about it. No big deal. And of the 96% that won't complain, do you know how many people they tell that they're not going to complain? 
9. And what they're doing is they're grumbling. I can't believe. I can't believe they treated me that way. I can't believe they didn't serve me. I can't believe this. I can't believe that. And the grumbling that takes place there is a passive-aggressive form of trying to have control because everybody knows if I tell nine people, they're going to tell nine. And suddenly I've got a lot of pressure on somebody who needs to hear what I need them to hear because I'm trying to control. James says, don't grumble. That's why the Bible takes grumbling so seriously. The Israelites grumbled in the desert wilderness. And the reason they say, what's the big deal about that? I mean, there's a lot of sins. Why is that such a big deal? God is saying, one, you are crushing my leaders, um, Moses and Aaron. Emotionally, physically even, they start breaking down because why? Because every day they've got a whole nation of people who are just grumbling. It's not outright kind of rebellion. It's just a grumble grumble, grumble, and it's eating them away. And then God says, and by the way, you think you're grumbling at Moses, you're grumbling right at me. Now, God has no problem whatsoever if you take a prayer of lament and frustration and anger to him. But God has a big problem when we say, no, I'm just going to go ahead and spread it out to other people. And God says, no, that's, that's because you're impatient, you don't trust me. And recognize it as such because I want to heal you of that. I want to fix that in us. So grumbling is trying to coerce and control people. And it really comes down to, can I trust God to change the person that I'm so frustrated with? Or maybe not just frustrated. Sometimes we have a really good desire. You have a family member or a friend who doesn't know Jesus yet, and you've been praying for years and years. And at some point, you're just like, man, I have given them the clearest gospel presentation ever. I mean, I used PowerPoint slides, and I had everything just, they couldn't have been clear what they need to do and why they need to respond to Jesus. And they just say, hey, that's great for you. I'm happy for you. I just don't want any parts of it. Now, at some point, if we're impatient, we're not going to have love, and we will, we will act out. We'll be frustrated with them, or we'll give up on them. Fine. I'm cutting ties with you. I don't need that hassle in my life. Or a lot of times we will bear down and we'll try to control them and say, I will make them come to Jesus. And of course, what we see is people get further and further from Jesus when they're trying to be manipulated or controlled. And the question is, can I trust God? You love them more. God, you love this person more than I do. And I love them a lot. But I'm going to trust you to make the changes and not me. And let me close with this. How do you... How do we say, how do you get this stuff? It's not, you cannot condemn yourself into patience, okay? Somebody just kind of make sure you get that before you go here. What I mean by this is that there's a guy in the grocery store, a young dad, he's got his young son, and he's, his young son sitting in the grocery cart, strapped in, but his young son is having a horrible day. He's crying, he's screaming, he's kicking, he's grabbing stuff off the shelves if he can reach it, throwing it down, and the whole time, the young dad, in a really remarkably calm voice, is saying, Donald, it's going to be okay. It's just, it's okay. Settle down, Donald. It's going to be fine. You're going to make it through this, Donald. Don't worry, Donald. This is going to be over soon, Donald. And one of the, a woman in the grocery store was noticing this, and she couldn't help herself. She said, I just got to tell you. She said, I, I know how hard parenting is, she said, and I, I just got to commend you. Because it would be really easy to just lose it right now. Lose all your patience and just scream at him and holler at him. But you've got such a great way with him. And I just want to encourage you along those lines. And then she bent down and she looked into the face of the little boy who was still crying. And she's like, Donald, what is so wrong that you're giving your dad such a hard time? And, and then the man says, oh, no, no, no. I'm Donald. He said, that's, that's my son, Henry. That, I'm Donald. And, and so you kind of get this sense that, oh, so maybe the way I get patience is like, Cliff, you're going to get through this. It's okay, Cliff. You're going to bear through this, Cliff. Let me just tell you that that's not going to get you the patience that the Holy Spirit wants to give you. How do I get it? You get it by going back and saying, if I'm going to be patient with people, I got to get it first from God. And is God patient with you? And you got to start thinking, how? How is God patient with me? 
How is it that I have a patience that's already flowing into my life because I need it? Like if I don't get God's patience again today, I'm lost. And he's constantly pouring this patient love into me. That's why I really love thinking about people like James says, think about these people like Peter. Why? Because he screws up all the time. Like he's one of the first disciples, but he's also the first one to always mess things up. And hey, Jesus, what's this parable about? You guys don't get this one yet? No, I don't know. I don't get this at all. And Peter goes through these whole series of ways in which he fails miserably as a disciple. And every time it happens, you're thinking, maybe today is the day that Jesus has had enough. And he says, I got enough disciples, I can jettison this one because this one is defective in some way. He's not keeping up. He doesn't understand. He's, he's always putting his foot in his mouth. He walks on the water, which is great. Nobody else did. But then right away, wind and wave and his attention gets away from me and he sinks. But I grab him right away, instantly, immediately. Not a second thought about letting him sink. Peter argues with the other disciples about who's the greatest among them man, i got to sit these guys down, but I'm not going to give up on them. Peter wants to set up memorial shelters on the Mount of Transfiguration. You've missed the point, Peter. It's not about the place. It's about who I am, but I'm not going to give up on him yet. Peter actually rebukes Jesus for talking about dying on the cross. No way, Jesus. You're, I hate to say it, but you're wrong. You're wrong, Jesus. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to let it. And Jesus actually has to say, actually, Satan's using you right now, but I'm not giving up on you. I'm not done with you. Peter's the one who, out of all the disciples who all felt weird about this, but Peter's the only one recorded to have told Jesus, you will not wash my feet. Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you got no part of me. Here's a guy who doesn't even want to let, but I'm not giving up on you. I'm not done with you. Peter keeps, and gosh, in this critical moment, the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus takes his closest disciples and says, I need you guys right now. I know we've prayed a lot in the three and a half years we've been together, but right now I need you to pray and watch with me at this critical moment. Okay, guys? Yeah, Jesus, we got you. Comes back and they're asleep. Three times. Is three times enough? To finally say, I'm done. Jesus, I'm not done. I'm not giving up on these guys. And then, of course, the worst failure. I don't even know him. Talking about oaths and curses, it says he actually cursed, Peter said, when he was asked. He said, I'm telling you, I don't even know this guy. I have no connection to him. If anything's going on with him, it has nothing to do with me. And in that moment where Jesus could say, well, I think we've reached the breaking point now. Jesus specifically after the resurrection. When Peter actually has given up on ministry, he goes fishing. Hey, disciples, I'm going fishing because I know I've blown it as a disciple. No way God can use me now. He's given up on me. And he goes fishing, and Jesus specifically goes after Peter and says, Peter, i got to talk with you. I'm not done with you. I didn't quit on you. I want you to go feed my sheep. But Jesus, I have forfeited every opportunity. I don't give up on you. And if you and I could hear that, like the moment when you're you're confessing your sins by the end of this day, and we go back over the day, we're like, man, there it was again. There it was again, another sin, this sin. That you could hear Jesus say, I am not giving up on you. That the patient love of God is flowing to you right now. Well, then you got something to work with. But I think we got to go back and say, God, you're going to have to fill me up again. You have to, your patient love coming to me. Because if I can just remember even a little bit of how patient you are with me, then there's a chance that I can show this kind of patience to other people as well. Let's pray.